in the Minnesota House. I want to welcome you to the Senate District 63 Forum on the Constitutional Amendments. Uh, the numbers of the legislative districts are changing, which is why I can be representing District 62A, but welcome you to a District 63 uh, DFL event because I, will be, I am running for the District 63A uh, seat for re-election. Uh, just to add a little confusion to the whole bit. I'm uh, honored to be joined today by my colleagues, uh, Senator Patricia torres Ray. Very pleased and grateful that Congressman Keith Ellison has taken time out of his schedule to be here. And my House colleague, Representative Jim uh, Every election, those of us who have the privilege to uh, be in office, tell you that this election is critical to the future of our state and our country. And it's true because in a democracy, elections matter. Uh, ask our friends in Wisconsin about whether elections matter or not, and I'll tell you they do very much. This year, I think we mean it in Minnesota a little bit more than ever before. Because of the strategy by the GOP to bypass the elected officials in the state, to bypass Governor Dayton specifically, who you put in office, and instead go to the voters with two constitutional amendments and put things into the Constitution that simply don't belong in constitutions. And that's what we're here to focus on today. The, we'll either call it, depending on our language, the marriage amendment, or the anti-marriage amendment, depending on how you approach it. Uh, and then the voter ID amendment, and we may have some different language about how we talk about that as well. Because certainly one of the things that the pro proponents of these two amendments have done is very carefully and very smartly use language to confuse, to draw people in. How can you complain about you know, okay. the language that they use. And so we will try to pull apart some of the language and some of the other issues around the amendment. Uh, I want to start uh, with uh, respect to our congressional colleague and give Congressman Allison a chance to get us rolling. Thank you. Uh, well, well, first of all, I, I may be a congressman, but I will always and forever be your colleague, state legislator, you right. guys. Uh, and uh, we go back ways, and we've been uh, standing together fighting for a better America. So it's really an honor to be here. This is an activist meeting, so you know we're going to do a little bit about what it is. But I figure you all already know what it is. The real question in front of us is, what are we going to do about it? Am I right? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So, so the real deal is that. Um, I'm very encouraged by what I've seen around the voter ID because uh, voter ID, uh, the initial polls were at, at like 78% approval. And there were a lot of folks around the state were like, you know, you can't beat it, just let's just go on to something else. But some hard headed folks, like up here, <laughs> said, um, no, we're not, we're not going to. Worry, we believe the polls can be moved, you know? And now it's down to about 58. So we're still not winning, but we're doing way better. And here's the other thing. On a more recent poll, we, we, we started the poll out and it was about, about 58. And as the more information was provided about what it would mean, it dropped down to around 52. So, but because here's the deal. Um, their whole case is so paper thin. It sounds like it, I mean, it does make basic gut level common sense if you say someone should identify themselves uh, if they're going to vote well, you, well, you're like, yeah, okay. But if you scratch the surface, it begins to break down. And so we've got we've to keep on pressing. Here's a few arguments that I think may help. Um, and again, I, I think that we've got to tailor arguments for different audiences. There was a time when I was uh, working with, in the state legislature with my friends up here where I had a bill that said if you're a felon and you're out, then you should be able to vote. Today, the law says after you've served your probation and parole, then you can vote. 
But my bill said, if you're out, you can go. And I realized that as I began to talk to different people, different people had different reasons why they might support it. But if I use the wrong argument on the wrong person, then they might not. So if I was talking to religious folks, I would emphasize redemption. You know, don't our faith traditions tell us that you are not the worst thing you ever did? And maybe, and then if I talk to criminal justice people like police, I'd say, you know, the statistics show that voting, which is a pro-social behavior, is, is, is actually uh, helps, you know, fulfill the goals of probation. We want people to do better, don't we? We don't want them to reoffend, right? Well, voting can help them retie to community. And then when I talk to the people who just care about fiscal issues, I said, well, it's cheap. Do we really want our, social, our Secretary of State running around figuring out all this stuff? It's just plain old cheap. It lowers administrative burden. Fewer regulations, right? And then, uh, so, so what I found out is that you've got to sometimes use different arguments for different people. So when it comes to the voter ID thing, I have found that one thing that I think is, has some persuasive value with a lot of people is the argument that it will inevitably result in a local property tax increase. Because if they say that it's a free ID, because the, the amendment says free ID, well, we all know that there's not, nothing's actually free. You may not pay for it, but somebody is. And what will happen? Well, the, the federal government, trust me, is not paying. <laughs> the state government is probably not paying. Ends up being a, an unfunded mandate. So who's paying? Well, local and county officials. Well, so then we're either, and it could be in the millions of dollars, by the way. Ramsey County said it was going to be in millions because they've done their own analysis. And they, they have said, and, and so the question is, are we going to lay off people who work at the jail? Are we going to, or are we going to raise property taxes? Are we going to shut down services at the county hospital? Or are we going to raise property taxes? Or maybe we've got to do both. So now we're getting fewer public services for more money. For something that is absolutely, positively not necessary at all. And so the thing is, is that I think that is an argument that you may want to use as you talk to your friends, your neighbors, as you talk to your social circle, your book club, your church or faith community group, that, that property tax argument, I think, can come in handy for you. I think, yeah, go ahead. Well, one of the things I think we should do is ask folks if they want to know. One of the things that we should ask you about is, do you know what the consequences of this voter ID are for you? Because I think one of the things that's happening, and we'll, we, we need to ask and hear from you, that we are talking about people who uh, may not be able to same day register. I'm guessing every one of you right here uh, actually uh, votes, don't need same day registration. But do you understand the consequences for you if you choose to do absentee validity? Can I add that to that, Gene? I, I want to welcome Gene's question to you, but I want to add one more thing. Now, some of you probably will vote on an election day, but I know I know many people in this audience who are real, you know, busy on election day. You know, you, you know, some of you guys are like, wait a minute, on election day, I'm working on the election. So, some of you do kind of register beforehand or absentee vote because there is a reasonable belief that you won't be in the precinct on election day. I'm one of those people. And so, what, you know, you, this, this is still a very relevant question because if you can't, you, you may need to absentee vote. So. So, I want to ask you, I want to make sure everybody had one of these in hand, one of the pieces of paper that had the actual language of the Constitution, what would go into the Constitution. And the reason I pose this is because I think for the marriage amendment, everybody understands what's going to happen. There's no misunderstanding whatsoever. But on the voter ID, it's different because the, the question to the citizens is, do you want a voter ID? 
but what will go into the Constitution is these two extra lines uh, underlined on the bottom of this piece of paper. I, I want to read one particularly in one line in particular because I don't understand what it means. And if I don't understand what it means, then I want to know what people are thinking, what, what the Republicans were thinking about when they put this, when they proposed to put this language in. And here's the language. Look at the C, which is at the very bottom of the page, which you will not see when you go to vote. You will not see this. It says all voters, including those not voting in person, that's the absentee voters, that's the ones I'm, I'm thinking about right now, must be subject to substantially equivalent identity verification. What is that? What is that? Is it that you have to have your fingerprints on record? Maybe put a fingerprint on your absentee ballot? What does this open up? I can't answer that question. And I don't think we should put anything in the Constitution that is not clear and direct and we know the consequences. Uh, so this is one of the things that we need to talk about. So that's why I want to draw your attention to that particular language. Because I've heard lots in the media about no same day registration, but not lots in the media about absentee balloting. I think Minnesotans like the ability to absentee ballot. And in fact, if they had their druthers, they'd probably like it a bit easier. Not the potential to have it harder. That's some of the folks are out here thinking, well, what should we do? Should we, somebody asked me about maybe three months ago, should we, should we litigate the voter ID issue? I said, yeah. Should we vote to overturn it? Defeat it? Yeah. Should we, everything. Let's not, you got a good idea, let, 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 let's do it. Let's let a thousand flowers bloom when it comes to defeating this awful thing. Uh, Gene, what, should we head into the center? Or? Okay. They have some questions about these amendments. First, so we all have a common understanding of the wording because it's legal words that go into the Constitution. A huge consequence. The current system for validating when someone is a appropriate voter, what do we have now? Look, this is an excellent question. Why don't we answer that? Well, I'm glad you asked. Uh, because what, what the Secretary of State's office will talk about is when you register to vote, there's a number of steps that they go through to verify your appropriateness for voting. And the steps are, first, uh, they make sure that you actually exist. You know, are you really who you say you are? Um, using a couple of databases from the Department of Vehicle Services and the Social Security Administration. Secondly, are you serving a felony sentence? That's the issue that Congressman Ellison raised. Uh, as long as you're on paper, is the, the street terminology, you're not allowed to vote. Once you've completed uh, supervision of the court, then you're allowed to vote. Your civil rights are restored in Minnesota. Are you a citizen is the third check, because obviously you can be resident here uh, and not be a, legally and not be a citizen. Fourth, do you reside at the address that you provided? So give them your address if you actually live, live there. That's why they mail you a postcard with your voter uh, information on it, your full name and your polling place. It's a test to make sure that that address exists and that you actually live there. That's number four. Number five, has the court revoked your uh, rights uh, as a person under guardianship? Someone with a significant disability of some sort, maybe a guardian of the state. If you're a guardian, you do not have the right to vote. Sixth, have you moved? Again, this is that, that postcard going out. Are, have you given up the right, the proper address? And lastly, are you dead? 
And with that, they go to the Department of Health and the Social Security Administration, the folks who track that information and have databases. And then I think importantly, and something that's often lost, because you don't read the small print, is when you go in to vote, they ask you for your name, they then ask you to confirm your address on record, and then they always spin the book around and you sign, you are signing an affidavit that you are in fact who you are, residing at that address, and a violation of that affidavit is itself a felony. So there are already significant, I always try not to do felonies, it's just been a personal rule. Um, it's, there are already significant penalties in place for violating this process now. So that's a, a full and detailed answer to your question. I think there's another question here. You always get the standard, you have to show your ID and other things. What's the quick answer for that? It's not true. Let me tell you, I use my credit card today, and I at Cup Foods. And right now, the way it works is that you go, I mean, who's been to Cup Foods like within the last few days? You, you don't show, you don't even hand your credit card or your ID. You, there's the, the, the little machine, you swipe it. So did you, did you show your ID then? No. I mean, the fact is, it's a false statement, and uh, we, should, we need to challenge it. But see, here's another argument for you. They're trying to equate a commercial transaction with a constitutional right. And you have, I mean, do you have to show your ID to offer an opinion? Free speech? Do you have to have a show an ID to, to, to redress grievances? How about to get a fair trial? How about to make sure that your religion uh, is treated the same as everybody else's with the government? These are our constitutional rights. And so it's a fundamentally different kind of uh, thing. And so, and, and if you falsify, you're gonna be in big trouble. But I'm gonna tell you this, uh, you know, all, and all the time I've been working on getting folks to vote, and I think I can speak for my friends here, our problem is not people voting twice or three times, it's getting to vote even once. <laughs> That's the tough part. I, and, and I think if people have challenged the folks who are pushing this, show us one person who is imposter voting because they want to conflate illegal voting and, 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 and imposter voting. And they want to just use a general category of fraud. Look, if a person has a felony and they vote, that ain't fraud. That's illegal voting. But if a person says, I am John Smith, but I am actually Keith Ellison, and I vote as John Smith, and then I go vote as Keith Ellison. Now you're talking about fraud, but they haven't shown us that this is something that is occurring. So why do we have to do it? We gotta pay millions of dollars to prove, to stop something that isn't happening. That's dumb. Yes, sir? I think it should be remembered that neither the driver's license nor the social security number were ever intended as an identification. Great point. They're just used because they are convenient, but convenient does not necessarily mean valid. Did you falsify a driver's license? Oh, wait, we have never heard of anyone having a fake ID in high school. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's pretty fake, easy to get a fake ID. You probably can get the software for a reasonable amount of money to, to make yourself a passable ID if that's your goal, you know. But the truth is, people commit crimes because they want money, because they have because they have an impulse problem. There are reasons why people violate the law, but there is literally no real incentive for an individual person to decide. You know what? Today I'm going to vote illegally. Most of the people who voted who are felons. You know, they did not. Proposal on the House floor here in Minnesota that said, you know, when you get out of prison, we're gonna notify you, hey, if you're on probation or parole, you do not have the right to vote. So you're fully informed and not able to vote. And then when you complete your sentence and you're done and you're able to vote, we're going to notify you that amongst the things that just happened is you regained your right to vote. He was defeated by the Republican majority. I was vetoed by the I want to help me on this. 
I may be misremembering. Do you say it last time clock? The clock. He's tried it twice. One time, it made it through the House and the Senate, and Pelini beat it. And then the second time, the Republicans defeated it. Now, if they're worried about felons voting, why wouldn't they? You see what I'm saying? Okay, so that's a, and that's one other thing. I don't want to talk too much. I do have that problem, folks. Forgive that for a moment. And this goes back. I remember what I was going to say a moment ago. Um, here's the thing. Democrats have to be Democrats. It's hard to be other than you are. I mean, if you are a certain way, then that's the way you got to be. I mean, in all, if you, if we're, we're, we're not suddenly going to have this herd instinct that's going to allow us to just all recite the same thing in a minus way. It, it, we're just not going to do it. I mean, so what can we do that fits with how we are? Here's the deal. Every Democrat, everybody who's politically liberal, even if you're somewhat conservative but mostly liberal, you need to take communication on as a personal responsibility. What do I mean by that? If I, I hear people say to me, people say to me all the time, how come nobody is saying anything about killing the black? Who has heard somebody say that? And whenever people say that, I think to myself, well, then you say it. Say it to your bridge club. Say it to your book club. Say it to your church group. Get on Twitter and say it. Get on Facebook and say it. Because if our base, and again, all of us here are activists, right? This is an activist meeting. If our base hears us start acting herd-like, remember, they're Democrats. They're not going to like it. They're going to rebel just because they don't like being boxed in like that. So how do we overcome that? We all take personal responsibility for communication. We don't have to say it exactly the same way, but we got to say the same thing in our own way. And if we all take responsibility for it and see communication as a personal responsibility, then I think that is how we get over this problem of not having, I mean, we should get the mantra. We should work for the words. Gene is great at that kind of stuff. But, but at the end of the day, Democrats are going to be Democrats. So the real question is, take it, take the message, and spit it out a thousand different ways. Um, and, and let me just say this last point. Remember this, here's something you can explain to your friends. This, thing, this is about power, it's not about anything else. It's about power. And it, you know, you know, let me tell you, I know a lot of people in this room think, well, Obama didn't do this, didn't do that. Let me just say this. From their perspective, it was a left-wing takeover in 2008. It was a rebuke of these crazy wars, of the crazy tax policy, of all this, you know, of this basic idea that poor people have too much money and rich people don't have enough money. It was a rebuke of all that. That's the way they saw it. So once you get a rebuke, what are you going to get next? Backlash, right? Why do we have a war on women now? Because we have because we had successful women's rights a few years ago, right? So they're coming. They're, they're not going to stop. It's not over just because the rent. we might have won one last round, they're going to win next round. That's the way they see it. And so we've got to look at it as this is a thing about power and trying to cut out our people so they can they can get power. So I'll be here. Let, let me uh, transition us a little bit, but, but start with the issue of uh, message. Oh, yes, Catherine. Back to the issue about the about you have to use my name, Democrats have to use my name. Why don't you, why don't you stand up? Or we'll get you a microphone. No. If you say something, it's better fact that people can hear it. That's the first rule of communication. Um, I'm Catherine Dora from Senate District, New Senate District 60, formerly 59. Our current senator is Carrie Dietzik up in Northeast Minneapolis. Um, I just wanted to say something real quick, and then I had a question on the thing, the message that the Republicans are putting out about you need an ID to cash a check to get on an airplane. The part about getting on an airplane is not true because we had some of our, our members in CEI do this. Um, to board an airplane, if you are um, stopped at the security gate because they think you're carrying a weapon or something, you are submitted to more extensive searches. You do not have to pull out an ID. You, it just takes you more time and they hand search your bags and you may have to do a strip search, but it is the ID is not required. My question is, because I'm an election judge, this is the problem I've had with this um, 
Republican attack on our voting. One of their messages is, if you cast a ballot and you're, you're not supposed to, okay, but say for example, you're not a citizen or you're voting in the wrong precinct, and you cast that ballot, that ballot is counted because all the verification steps are done after election day. And because our ballots are secret, later on, after all the verifications are done, the election staff cannot go back and delete one vote because they don't know how you voted. And this was the basis of the federal lawsuit yesterday, which we won't hear the results of until two months from now, which kind of bothers me that it takes that long. Um, this is the one most difficult argument I've had in talking with people about countering the Republican message on voter ID. What can I say? I'm sorry. So I didn't quite catch what you. So the the, the issue is saying they don't registration. Yeah, we've had such close elections here in Minnesota. So that ballot has already been scanned and counted, but then later they find out that you're not. So so I have a question. So. Is this going to be passed? Is it have? To, is this going to be passed before the election? Is it going to be passed? No. After the this will be on the ballot on election day. We're going to decide this on election day. So people are going to be able to vote the way they vote, right? And, and but, more, but it just seems like it just seems like it's like it seems like something that discussed after the election rather than during the election. No, no, no. I, mean, but I, I, I think I can help with this. What's interesting about this constitutional amendment is that we have just the words that are going into the Constitution, but we don't have the statutory language that implements it. So, it will depend on the next legislature, Republican, or Democrat to put into statute what they want to put in to implement it. That's why I come back to this absentee ballot and the substantial equivalent verification of a photo ID to uh, absentee ballot. I don't know what the Republicans have in mind if they are in the majority to put in statute for substantially equivalent. And I don't know what a legislature 10 years from now might have in mind to put into statute. Uh, that's one of the problems here. That's why you don't want to have it in the Constitution. Generally, on election law, it's Democrats and Republicans agree on changes, and that's why it passes. This is so different because it's a Republican initiative alone. And that's why it's very different from anything else we've ever had in the past. So I think that's, um, the statute can change this a lot because the words are so loose. I don't like constitutional amendments that aren't absolutely precise. Uh, you got some more questions if you want to take those. Well, let's start, and I won't necessarily answer them. Jim? Well, I was just wondering about the absentee ballot parts, especially when we have so many of our Minnesota people over uh, fighting the Republican War. Uh, how would they be able to vote absentee and have the ballot count? We don't know. Can you repeat the question and summarize okay. the question? So I okay, he's asking about people overseas, uh, particularly in the military, who will necessarily have to vote absentee, and what's the impact on them? That's the problem, Jim. I don't know. Because it is the next legislature that puts into statute kind of the rules of the road. And that's why this loose language which can be interpreted very broadly, or perhaps very narrowly. Um, it's up in the air. That's one of the problems here. Just quickly, to try to, from my point of view, summarize your answer and his question in simpler terms. Was the legislative 
with uh, the constitutional amendment, we are voting to enforce a law that has not yet been written, and we don't know how it will be written. And if I got yours right, it is, how can we be sure the Department of Defense will enforce the rules that Minnesota statute will require? We don't. But for my anecdote here, on um, my birthday in August, with government shutdown last year, I decided I'd play it safe. I'd go in in June and apply for my driver's license. It turns out I didn't pass the vision test. I had to go to an, op to an eye doctor, have my eyes checked, have a form filled out, said it'll be all right, he'll be able to drive with new glasses. The form was supposed to be faxed into a fax number. He did that. I asked for a hard copy of the form so I could take it to the government service center and hand it to them personally, just to be safe. They faxed it in because they were surprised to find out that the new process was it was supposed to be faxed. Before that, you had to have the hand signed copy so you could see the signature. This caught the people at the government service center off guard. Well, the government shut down. I didn't know how long it would take to get my license. I kind of dropped off my mental radar with job hunting and the such. I was applying for a job in December. And they said, oh, we can't use your ID. Your receipt for your license is expired. You have to get it re-signed. I went to the government service center. They called in to the DMV in St. Paul and said, we have no record of ever receiving this form. Nothing's been processed. I had to get another form. I had to go back to the eye doctor. I had to have them refill it out. I brought it back and happened to get the same guy who processed it the first time. So he said, no, I want to find out what's going on here. And he took extra care to check up on it. I eventually got my license in late January or early February. I'm not entirely certain my memory. It took me seven to eight months to get my photo ID. Now my question is this. If that had been an election year, and I had been unable to vote because I had not received my valid new license, who, what individual is charged with the federal crime? Yes. You know, let me tell you this, I gotta go now because I gotta be somewhere at one, but I wanna thank y'all for allowing me to participate. Uh, I just wanna wrap up by saying this. What is needed are organizers and activists and communicators. I would love the fact that we're thinking out in a very good intellectual way all these possible scenarios and stuff. But at the end of the day, it's got to be made. We got. We all have to take responsibility for communicating the right for people to vote. We all got to talk to our networks, and we all got to act extremely urgently. My campaign is devoted to defeating this thing, like everybody else is here, and so. Um, thank you all for taking your time out on a beautiful Saturday to preserve our right to vote as Americans and Minnesotans. So take the care. It's my understanding that if you do not vote on the amendments, it still counts as a no vote. Is that correct? Yep, that's true. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So if you're confused whether it should be yes or no, if you ignore it, it'll count the right way as far as we're concerned. That, that's correct. That is correct. Uh, if you do not vote, if you do not answer the question in the ballot, that counts as a no. Only when you say yes to a constitutional amendment, that counts as a vote for it. You actually have to vote for it. Uh, I'm Patricia Torres Ray, and I'm in the Senate. And with good luck, I will get in between representatives. That's why the house stays until three or four in the morning. You may get an idea because these guys are very thorough with yes, your expertise and your guidance as to how we can get people out to vote. Okay, so there is an issue about framing that is very important, and you just said it. You know why is that we have these messages that are so complicated? Why is that we cannot say something simple? Well, <laughs> listen to yourselves. You are not simple-minded people. You don't want a simple thing. So it's a very complicated thing for Democrats. But let's talk about then what should be our strategy. I think uh, each and every single one of us are going to share with you some of the things that we have been targeted to do. It is my experience from being in the Senate for the last six years 
I truly believe that each and every single one of you have an audience. And it's a real audience that really believes in who you are and how you define things. And, and I, I, I don't care who you are, even if you're an introvert who only knows the three people around your block, that is your audience and you have it. Believe me, you have it. We need you to go out to talk to that audience and we need you to start that tomorrow because those three or four or five or ten also have an audience. And if there is something magic about this message when you are the one who delivers that to the person across the street from you, there's something magic about it. I can go to their door ten times and I will not convince them. But if you are the one who go and say, you know, we're going to have a cup of coffee and I want to talk to you about these issues, they hear you in a very different way, and they do hear you. We have a lot of people in our district, a lot of people that are not using that power. Democrats are not using that power. People are not getting out to vote. They think, this is not going to happen, you know, I live in a very liberal district. There's no need for me to do this. People are going to get out to vote. We need every Democrat in this district, every Democrat, out on November 6th, voting against these constitutional amendments, and you're going to have to help us uh, make that happen. So I would like to welcome Scott, and I, I really want us to change the frame again. You know, I know you have a lot of questions about, you know, what do we do about this? What do we do about... What we want to hear from you is, this is our idea about how you can convince my neighbor. This is our idea, you know, for door knocking. What is... <laughs> We're never, I, 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 made, I, I made my assignment from the house here. Uh, <laughs> here, here it is. Okay. Uh, we've been talking about the voter ID amendment. Right. And one of the places that we spent some time was, was how do you message this? How do we communicate? And what I was going to share was uh, I've often get asked to attend house parties to raise funds for Minnesota United for All Families, fighting the marriage amendment. And I go in and I stay on message for most of my comments. And then I go off message and I say, look, it's not just about the marriage amendment. There's this other amendment too. And they are similar in that they both want to turn the Constitution, they both want to turn the Constitution from a document that protects our rights into one that takes our rights away. The voter ID amendment wants to take away your right to vote. The marriage amendment wants to take away your freedom to marry. So we need a simple message. And the message is no. And it's simple because those of you who are in this room aren't normal. You're taking a bit, which begins with the letters N-O, I guess, but um, you're taking a chunk out of your Saturday to come to this event. A lot of your good neighbors are going to walk into that voting booth without having put the level of thought and study into these two questions that you have already. And even with our best efforts to get out and engage them about why my marriage is important to me and why Scott's is important to him and why that's okay I'm for both of us as well as for all of us together. They're going to walk in that voting booth and they're going to confront these two questions. And we don't want them going, oh man, I'm supposed to vote against one of these. Now which one is it? And the other one, I, 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 because on a tactical level, at points, some of those folks are going to get it wrong. And they're going to vote yes on one they meant to vote no on, and no on one they meant to vote yes on. And some of these questions are going to be so close, we could lose over voter confusion. So it's November. And that makes it easy. So we want to shift over now to talking about the marriage amendment. Uh, this is Senator Scott Dibble, not just Scott, but Senator Scott Dibble, who's good enough to uh, join us here today on Pride Weekend to talk about this. I regret that I didn't, thanks Jim, um, or Representative Daphne, um, I regret that I didn't uh, bring my campaign literature uh, with me because um, that's exactly a, a major function of the literature that I've developed in conjunction with State Representative Frank Hornstein. We, we do joint literature together. Um, 
in the, in the part of the district that he hopes to represent. And uh, we devote a significant portion of the real estate on the, it's a leave behind for our door knocks. And it says, you know, vote in, and then we put big N-O member, and then a little, a little paragraph on voter ID, and a little paragraph on the anti-marriage amendment, um, and, and make the exact points, the message points that you make. And um, really the, uh, oh, before I forget, um, there's a coffee can that has been making the rounds. So please put some money in that because it helps pay for this forum and this venue. Nothing's free in life and we're paying for rent for this auditorium. So if you can throw in a couple bucks, that would be fantastic. Um, so the, uh, I, I just want to reinforce the message that uh, my good friend, Senator Torres Ray, conveyed. Um, I do uh, quite a few of these Minnesotans United for All Families events. Thanks. Uh, just to talk about the campaign and um, you know, talk about you know, why it's so important to, to beat this amendment and what marriage means and what this means in terms of freedom in our Constitution and, and uh, what this means in terms of core values that Minnesotans hold fundamental uh, and how that unites us across all sorts of different political perspectives and religious perspectives and demographics and geographics and et cetera, et cetera. But the core message uh, that I try to convey and leave with folks um, is really the secret, it's going to be the secret of our success and why we're going to win on this campaign and on, on voter ID, and that's telling personal stories and personal messages and having that personal contact one-on-one. -on -one. We are absolutely not going to win, and it's been proven time and time again in every other state. There's been 30 of them now. We're the 31st state to be confronted with this challenge, fundamental challenge to our, our foundational document, our Constitution. If we only rely on television commercials, the paid media, the billboards, the mail program, um, more traditional field type uh, of activities as well, you know, voter ID, persuasion, and GOTV, um, it's going to be about the one-on-one, -on heart-to-heart, personal story and connections. And that's been proven through research that in which we've gone back to all of these states where we thought we were going to win and we lost. And people who voted for these amendments actually had people in their own lives um, that were personally affected. You know, I'm talking specifically about marriage, but I think the same lessons hold, holds true for voter ID. And I think the messaging is showing that if people understand that their grandmother or their nephew who's uh, uh, in the military need, what does marriage really mean? On marriage, having this conversation is not as risky and not as anxiety provoking as perhaps people might think it could be. You know, we think, oh my God, I'm going to talk about marriage, with, you know, gay marriage with my grandmother. You know, that's kind of a scary thought. But, uh, you know, or my friend at work, or we, we don't talk about politics, or, you know, my neighbor across the backyard. Um, but it really um, is, is about inviting folks into a non-threatening conversation in which they can really surface what they value most and hold dear in their, in their own lives. Hey, I wanted to talk to you about you know, this amendment that's coming up in November on marriage. What do you think about that? You know, well, let me ask you, what, what, does, what does marriage mean to you? Why, why, do you? why did you get married? And you start asking these sorts of questions that surface for themselves an answer that seems so self-evident. I fell in love. I wanted to build a life with someone. I wanted to show my commitment in front of my friends and my family, invite them to our wedding, invite them to be part of our love, help them be a part of, help them be a part of my, our marriage, invite their support. And that's the perfect bridge in which we can respond by saying, exactly. You know, why, why do you think, you know, you ask the question, why do you think gay people, if you just ask the random person on the street, even people who have gay loved ones in their lives, co-workers or nephews or siblings or kids. You know, why do you think gay people get married and people literally, a big question mark pops up above their head? I don't know. I don't know why they want to get married. You know, or maybe, you know, I think it's an assessment to the messaging over the years. Well, I think it's something about inheritance, you know, medical decision making. None of these things actually answer the fundamental question that they're going to have in their heads when they go into the voting booth. You know, what is marriage? What does it mean? Who is it about? But when you say, in response to their talking about love and commitment and why they wanted to have a wedding and invite their family to be a part of that, you just have to say, exactly. That's exactly what this is about. 
And that has proven to bring folks, open their hearts, and bring folks to voting no by a factor of like 68, 70. We win with folks who have had that conversation by 70%. That's a winning number. You know, they're twice the, if the, the average person, even when they know a gay person, uh, is likely to vote yes or no, just based on kind of where, what bucket, what demographic they fall into. After they've had the conversation, they're twice as likely to vote no. Very, very powerful. And likewise, so that's very well-founded messaging, um, research, and, and not just messaging, but who the messenger is and how we deliver that message and how we operationalize and institute that in the context of a campaign. Um, that's well founded from the research in other states and that's proven and, been, and we're seeing a huge shift, a huge swing our way as we've been able to, to uh, roll this out over the past year and we have another five months to go. And the, and the research is emerging now because voter ID is just getting rolling. But again, it's about personalizing those stories, about really understanding the consequence in real people's lives to freedom. And freedom is a very powerful word, a very powerful value that we share broadly as progressive Democrats and as conservative Republicans and everyone in between. So in marriage, we talk about marriage is about love and commitment, the, you know, the freedom to marry, the freedom in our Constitution also means the freedom to marry and government should be in the position of telling people who they can and can't fall in love with and who they should be free to marry. And in Minnesota, we treat everyone with dignity and respect in the way that we would hope to be treated ourselves. Another way of talking about the golden rule. And, and those, you lay those out in the context of these conversations. I want to say one more thing. These conversations don't have to be a one-shot deal with the magic words that you convert someone, you know, you know, check them off your list and go on to the next. This is a, this is a process for a lot of folks. You have to start cracking open the door and return to the conversation maybe in a few weeks or a few months. And, and just kind of, so it doesn't have to be fraught with all of this, uh, you know, all of this uh, pressure. You know, I just posted on Facebook today this guy Blankenhorn, who was the key witness in the Proposition 8 uh, effort in California. This is my husband in California, uh, Richard, by the way, and we got married in California four years ago when it was legal. Yeah. So, proposition 8 in California, that was the proposition that then slammed the door shut. So if we were to get married, try to get married today in California, we could not. Um, he was one of the key drivers of Proposition 8, and and was on tap before he was disqualified to be one of the key witnesses in the, in the, in the Proposition 8 trial, has completely changed his views. Is now in favor of marriage for all people. So the world in Dick Cheney's daughter Mary just got married this last weekend, and he's delighted and thrilled. This is the guy who elected a president twice on anti-gay animus and prejudice, anti-marriage animus and prejudice. Um, so you know, the world is turning, processes are happening, uh, people are changing. We know a lot of people are changing their views on this subject. We just have to engage and help them along. Um, you know, we've got five months and we've made a lot of progress and I'm extremely encouraged. I'll, I'll suspend for the moment and hand it over to Jean. All right, are we browning microphone? Not to come to the front because we can now hear you and we're taking this. So let's, let's try to uh, get time for people to kind of finish. Yeah, I'll, I'll just say finish. what were their reasons? They just because they said, anybody can get an ID, and plus they're going to pay for it, what's the big deal? And then when I said, well, think of it this way. When I was a student going to Calister, I could go with my student ID and my Illinois state ID that I just arrived in both my freshman year. So good, at least 10,000 students plus come to the state each year just uh, just the progressive school or their freshman year would have to change over before November. In addition to that, I said that when you look at the last two post elections, they were they were just narrowly within less than a thousand votes. What that would mean is that if one in ten of those students didn't change over or didn't do whatever they needed to do to vote back in the state, they wouldn't have the ability to vote. And in a in a race like what happened the last few times, I could be like having in my opinion, ever, ever. <laughs> Thank you. We, we want to make sure that, again, we come back to uh, capture your idea. Um, this is a, a key issue with respect to minority. Uh, I have been uh, asked by the party and multiple organizations to 
help with organizing the vote in um, minority communities, particularly targeting the Latino community. And that issues around religion and how we um, really practice you know, uh, the Catholic religion um, in high numbers in the Catholic Church is a key issue. And I think what has helped me uh, kind of frame the issue with Latinos is to talk about the issue that uh, Jim was alluding to earlier with respect to exclusion. This is a unique time in history when, you know, we are the, we're asking people to vote to exclude people. And what I said to the Latino community that asked me is that we, we really need to take it in terms of how does that apply to me when we're talking about the Latino community and we're trying to convince elected officials to, to change the law so that we have many undocumented people here uh, are given, uh, so that we provide the opportunity to uh, get status in the United States. So we, we're expanding the right and when we talk about that and, and we, we frame it around, imagine if people will say that you will have absolutely no right and that we will put in the Constitution that we will never be able to give you the chance to obtain legal status in the United States, that you will never have that opportunity. That's what is happening here. So, so we have to understand that in terms of how this is, that these constitutional amendments and these exclusions apply to me personally. And, and so people think about it in a different way. So then the whole issue about, you know, my religion and, and really how, how am I viewing this, it takes a complete new frame. So we have to figure out how do we, how do we use those historic, cultural, and personal experiences to apply the same, the same theme, the same information, the same action to these personal circumstances of your life. And I think that works. It has worked for me time and time again. It's the same thing. The same thing we're doing proposing here. So, any other circumstantial issue that you feel is something that we need to keep in mind? You probably noticed that there is uh, a footboard coming around to sign up for uh, and just make sure that it's to sign up for the district uh, Yahoo list. Uh, that's one thing, and uh, I know that uh, Scott said that there was a can going around for contributions. If uh, you missed it, uh, please, on your way out, uh, think about helping pay for this facility. Thank you. Uh, I'll make it real quick. With other polling numbers are really uh, interested in what you said about the door knocking numbers. Progressive Polling Project, PPP, released a poll a few weeks ago that said in the African American community, 68% of the respondents to the question were in favor of photo ID. And the question they were given was exactly the one that's going to be on the ballot this fall. Um, that's our first challenge. And in the community of color, the African American community, we've got a two thirds in favor of this thing already, which is going to, it will incredibly disenfranchise black folks. Number two, I've heard this internally in my DSL context, because I sit on the Senate District Committee and other places, is that among DSL women, or women who identify themselves as DSLers, 56% are in favor of photo ID. So we have a double challenge. Not only do we have to convince the citizens of Minnesota to vote against these amendments, we have to convince our own DSL people, especially the women, that these are bad is that the photo ID is, is not a democratic equality thing to do <coughs> because obviously it wasn't connecting with them that this, these two amendments were a Republican-only initiative if they're, if they're marching to the tune of 56%. And, and so we need to work with them our own circles as well. Well, just a quick response. Um, we're, we're, you know, that's in the absence of folks having um, had the opportunity to receive good information and replacing bad information. That's what's insidious about this particular amendment is that on its face, you know, people um, agree with it, but once they understand the implications, the implications for values that they hold, like same day registration, like fair and equal access to the voting booths, like um, absentee um, 
the ability to vote absentee, the ability of folks that we that they personally care about being able to vote. So that's the whole purpose of the campaign. You can absolutely turn things around. You saw the Religious Freedom Amendment in North Dakota go down. That was running way, way ahead until people understood the implications of that amendment. You saw the person that amendment down in Mississippi running way, way ahead until they were able to understand that of the campaign and debates of uh, what the implications of that were. So I still am very optimistic that we can do this. We have a lot of people who have a question. If I may, uh, microphone. <laughs> what I want to hear as a voter is that we're getting a lot of misinformation. <laughs> that both of these amendments are really unconstitutional, and if they do pass, they should be challenged by our leaders as being unconstitutional. When we took the Pledge of Allegiance going through school, or whenever we go to these sporting events or wherever, it says, one nation under God, indivisible, indivisible, I say it again, with liberty and justice for all. Not for all except, but for all, period. What we're doing is trying to perfect the Constitution so that everybody has a chance, everybody has access, and as Keith Ellison says, everybody counts, everybody matters. I don't want to hold too much because I know there's much more that needs to be said, but again, I want to hear it's unconstitutional and then it will be challenged if it does pass. It's just inconceivable to me that it will pass, but it might. I don't know what the plans are in terms of a constitutional challenge, and I know we already see an effort to get voter ID off the ballot on constitutional grounds, um, uh, and, and I agree with you. However, um, you know, let me let me be just really, really clear. Engaging in um, what I call civic lessons types of debate about the purpose and role of the Constitution, et cetera, et cetera, just does not persuade and doesn't move people to know. Um, but really cutting to the heart of the matter, freedom is for everyone. Marriage is about love and commitment. Voter ID is a fundamental guarantee and a freedom that we have that the value that we share. Um, uh, you know, voting, marriage, fundamental values, what, what really pulls them out. We want to beat these first before we have to then go on and take on the important case. And we need to go where we know people are. We have to meet them where they're at. Well, we've got a, youth, the youth uh, activist, activation and youth vote is, is, is key. I mean, you know, the numbers show quite clearly, you know, where, where we're going to go to win. Um, but that is happening, you know, just by way of any reassurance, I was at a health party last night that was jammed full of young people. Richard was there. You can attest that uh, um, young people are, at least on the marriage campaign, uh, coming in droves. Um, and so with the block party specifically, um, last year, uh, a number of the artists, you know, because there was this huge effort to point out and so the block party that turned out to be not a great idea for a number of reasons I won't go into, but um, as an alternative, we uh, approached a number of artists to speak out and do shout outs from the stage on the amendment. Uh, and they did. Uh, and there's a lot of organizing, and that will happen again this year um, as well. And um, while Pride is not a news event, um, you know, Pride is happening this weekend. I think like, that's where we're going right after this. Fully 350,000 people um, participate in Pride activities over the course of the weekend, and every one of those 350,000 people is going to be touched uh, somehow uh, by this and the end of our event. And, and I, I just said one, give one more example. Uh, Minnesota's United had people with clipboards out in groves at Rock the Garden, uh, you know, talking about musical events that, that tend to, uh, I wasn't there, uh, attract a younger demographic. Uh, so they are very keen on where do we find the people that we need to find who we can connect with, move, and motivate to the whole. So I like to do that. I, I can't speak to, you know, what their roster is, but I can not say I know they're out in the rows of Rock and Garden. You know, the Minnesota United Office and the Office of 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 the
One point I'd just like to make is neither of these issues should be a constitutional amendment. If we want to make some changes in our voting laws, fine, have the legislature do some fine tuning. And, uh, but this is not an issue for a constitutional amendment, so vote no. I've been doing some phone calling, phone phone bank calling for President Obama and Keith Ellison. And one thing, um, when you're making personal phone calls to other, these are mostly other Democrats who are calling just to get out the vote and get volunteers. And um, you can also bring up the voting amendments and the, and the marriage amendment. And um, a lot of people really appreciate just getting the information about it. And so that's another way we can reach people. Just volunteer for a phone bank um, in the Obama campaign, a Keith Ellison campaign, or any other campaign. I think probably the marriage is united for families. Yeah. But that's a really good way to reach people one to one and have that conversation. Come help door knock in the 7th District 61. Uh, Frank and I are uh, uh, literally uh, attempting to get into every single apartment building uh, in the Senate district which we've never done before, but the whole idea of that and we're working in conjunction with Steve Ellison's campaign and their education is amazing. The whole idea is to reach young people who are not yet registered to vote. You know, conventionalism is just kind of chasing phantom votes and you're, you know, you're tilting a window and dispersing their energy where you shouldn't, um, but I think this year it's different. Um, that we, this is this is an issue uh, of of the time and its moment and the passion of young people around this subject, um, you know, around uh, the you know basic rights and freedoms to vote, to get married, um, as a way to really stroke their their energy and their passion. And so we're trying to get to every young person who maybe has not yet gotten into the habit of voting, hasn't registered, to talk to them, persuade them, get them registered, and get them to the polls. So. Come, uh, come door knock with us, or maybe uh, We are going to be uh, organizing door knocks, uh, the three of us, uh, Jim Daphne, Jim Wiggins, and myself, with many of you. We're going to be moving back and forth. You know, we're going to do a few on this side, we're going to do a few on the other side. And uh, call us if you want to organize one. Uh, we would be happy to work with you. Um, we're going to start. You know, we probably will do some things uh, during this next two months, but we really start heavy duty in September just because we do about, you know, 50 houses and we find two people and they don't want to talk to us. <laughs> so this is a very tough time to do door knocking. We're going to be doing some, some work, but we are going to start, you know, later on really more um, going almost I think every day we're going to be doing uh, a lot of work this year. So call us if you want to organize so we can put it in our calendars and we will figure out how to balance both sides. We have some uh, area and that was uh, because of redistricting. Now we have Richfield. So we want to make sure that we also uh, target that area and, and introduce ourselves, uh, Jean and I. So uh, please make sure that, that you call us and let's book a time to door knock together in this district. And let me stress just briefly the importance of having these conversations, whether it's a conversation with a coworker, a fellow parishioner, a bridge club member, whatever, or conversations with your neighbors at the door now. And it's, 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 it's vaccine, it's inoculation. Because particularly on the marriage amendment, the last few weeks uh, before the election is going to be the air war, where massive amounts of money are going to come in from out of state to buy radio and television ads to scare the bejesus out of you about what's going to happen if we don't uh, prevent gays and lesbians from getting married. And what that's going to mean to your church and how it's going to threaten your religious freedom, what it's going to mean to your kids and how it's going to threaten what uh, they're taught in schools. And it's going to be there to scare you. And what we need to do is engage people on these conversations now so they can recognize the BS when it starts falling from the sky because it's going to be intense and it's going to be heavily pressured and it's going to be personally threatening to people. And so the importance of having these conversations now to inoculate what's going to happen later is critical. Because we know what the playbook is on the 
pro-amendment side because we've seen them play it out 30 times successfully. Councilmember Quincy from the 11th Board, thank you for being here. Uh, I just wanted to speak briefly um, on the uh, issue of the city charter referendum that might be, may be coming up. Um, it's still undecided, as I understand at this time. There are two issues I think that the charter, amend, uh, the charter commission could be bringing forward to be put on the ballot. One is about uh, restructuring of terms of office and who's elected. Um, and there's another one uh, but I, it, it, on the plain language charter revision uh, of whether the whole city charter should be uh, converted to a plain language version versus the process that we've had now for the last 150 years. Uh, so those those may come up and be on the uh, amend, or on the ballot, uh, and that decision will be made, I think, in the next uh, two or three month, two months, uh, because we're coming up to the deadline of when ballots will be published. So those are the, some of the issues that are out there, and and one of the things that we're trying to stress to the Charter Commission is that it would complicate some of the issues because the uh, City Council has been unanimous on uh, putting it into as, as packs and resolutions that were firmly opposed to both of these amendments. There's nothing um, insignificant about those resolutions because this is a United City on these two topics. Um, but we're, we're going to have a lot of discussion more about the Charter amendments. Uh, so it could complicate the, uh, the internal uh, within the city uh, on how we'd be messaging towards a yes or a no on those kinds of issues. So it's a good point to look at and we're studying it very carefully. Does that help? Yeah. And I don't know that any of us can speak to the polling that Curtis Mills and spoke to because I think he saw that poll on the right. Yes. So the question is about the economic impacts, I think both public impact to our economy, to our, to our um, public um, tax, uh, taxpayer expenses, as well as personal private um, costs that are more private. Um, I'll, I'll try to be quick, but the short answer is uh, there's, uh, if we defeat these amendments, all the economics, personal and public, are good. <laughs> if we pass them, they're all bad. Uh, so uh, cost, it'll cost us personally and publicly, and the cost for our economy um, is shown to be negative. The consequences are negative in both instances. It's pretty self-evident. Um, significantly uh, economically disadvantaged when folks actually can't uh, get married. Um, there's also, we've seen the business leadership step up and say um, Minnesota is a place uh, that has a lot of loyalty, uh, you know, worker loyalty because people love this place and part of why they love this place is because it's a place of, of creativity, of vitality, of openness and, and, um, and tolerance, et cetera, et cetera. And that's all to the good in terms of attracting and retaining a great workforce. Uh, and then it would, would cut against that. Um, so it's Con likes to say, you know, uh, Iowa is eating our lunch because they're having all those weddings and <laughs> attracting all those Minnesota weddings. <laughs> I don't know if that actually adds up or not, but uh, fun to think about. Um, and then uh, there is a significant expense, you know, that folks have to go to to get all the proper documentation if they don't actually have it as uh, the requirements of voter ID. There's a significant expense to um, elections officials at the local level, clerks at townships and cities and county level. Um, additional administrative expense that runs into the millions of dollars. Um, anyone else have more information? Talk a little bit about that um, So it sounds like uh, Scott, you have um, a piece of literature that you use that does describe why people should vote and watch all of these. And I'm kind of wondering about um, having that available to people to hand out when they're at various kinds of events and things this summer. I think because I, I agree that summer is a hard time for door knocking, but I think that we do have a lot of young people who are available for literature dropping, and I think it is important that in the inoculation sense that we get information out sooner rather than later. So I'm wondering about you 
making a piece that would be a more general piece, not necessarily a soul piece. I'm not sure how that would get paid for, but um, uh, just that people could have to be able to circulate um, and to use our youth during the summer when they're out of school to help with some of that circulation, which should also be educational for them. I think that's a great idea. And maybe, you know, the three of us could work. We've done this before. We usually try to use our resources to collaborate and produce a piece that will be for the entire district and split it into a B side. So we definitely will take that advice and, and move forward with it. I think part of the economic impact is that you just created jobs for people in the graphic design. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, I'm Suzanne, and I, I've came to remind you about five times of what I wanted to say. <laughs> the, the silliest thing is, and goes to economic impact, that maybe the state has, will have to be forced to give us our first photo ID free to everybody. And I think there's a fairness issue there, too. It would still cost us all the documentation. But I can see that loss of coming after if this horrible thing would happen. But, and I appreciate all of the ideas and the urgency of, of really getting to our neighbors and our friends within the district, within the city. But I've also heard some rumblings that we really need to get out into greater Minnesota. And you know who's organizing? I'd be willing to go on the caravan and door knock in rural Minnesota um, and, and spread the message there because I think there's a lot of ignorance and a lot of resistance right now because of ignorance. So is anybody organizing for that? I think that the, the United Families is, but are we doing it for the voters? We go with the voters doing it. Who's, who's going to get me on the road this summer? I think that, you know, the courts rely on the higher well, Yellow knows where the most operation, and that's a hotbed of conservatism. There are a number of non-profit, non-partisan groups. I don't want to leave it with the voters of DEI, as I mentioned. We've been doing road shows in February. League of Women Voters have chapters all over the state, and they are doing community forums. They're putting out literature. We've got some videos on the League of Women Voters uh, website, lwbmn.org. So, and, and there's a lot of church groups. Our, our UU churches have uh, passed resolutions on this in the metro area. We're working with the outstate, the great Minnesota churches. So, yes, um, it's not just within the political parties. It's also the non-partisan, non-profit, religious groups, all kinds of groups are working against these. And, and there is a campaign that has been, you know, an umbrella coalition campaign that has been pulled together to fight uh, voter ID. Um, Probably the lead organization is Take Action in Minnesota, but it's a broad-based coalition. Many senators have presented labor or others. Um, and if you go to our vote, our future, all mushed together, O-U-R votes, O-U-R future.org, our vote, our future.org, um, that's a place to find more information and also to um, pledge to vote now and to put your name and contact information. Um, with the campaign so they can be in touch with you about volunteer opportunities, giving opportunities. Let me just add, I mean, I understand the need to go out and talk to everybody all over the state, but I want to come back home for a minute, too. And that's because up here, we represent the four legislative districts out of, I'm not talking about House legislative districts, out of 134 that are always the top DFL vote producers. Not percentage, but actual votes. So, if, and, and I think we've been consistent with that. The potential in, in the four House races is huge. Because we have more votes, people who are willing to vote, willing to go out and vote, than many, many reliable DFL districts, like on the Iron Range, where the numbers are much smaller. So do not underestimate the importance of us. One of the people who is not underestimating the importance of us is Tony Sutton. I don't know if you all saw his op-ed piece yesterday in the uh, Star Tribune. I mean, he's a former uh, Republican chair. 
And he said, if Obama wins, it will be because of the inner city and the inner ring suburbs. He is really talking about the four legislative districts that are represented right here. We should get the end of it because of us. We have the highest percentage and the highest raw number in Senate District 60. Thank you very much. Wait, wait, wait. <laughs> <laughs> just, just out of respect to time, we should probably take one or maybe two more questions and then, and then wrap it up. To, we, we started roughly on time. It would be nice to for everybody to end on time as well. Yeah. I'm just going to leave the information on joining the impact and having a meeting July 1st at 1 o'clock at 28th and it's right off of Hennep and it's a uh, congregational church as it is. But basically if, if you want to join us for that meeting, we're working on the two amendments and uh, coming up with a response. But we would like to do it in coalition with others because really it's a small group within the gay community that sees the importance of the two issues. Um, and that's so basically for those who want to join us on Sunday, July 1st at 1 in the afternoon. I think it's Grace Trinity Church. That's right there, right by the Lake of the Eye. Half a block for them. About half a block west of Hamilton on 28th. Can that actually be included in the email that lists what we just said? I mean, what we just Asked for, can that be, I mean, we generated an email list, right? Can that be included? Sure. Uh, fortunately, I'm recording this, so I should be able to get into the email list. Okay. Thanks for asking me. I, I think, you know, Congressman Ellison really hit the, uh, hit the theme well in that this has got to be an activist and organizer meeting, and folks are doing it. Uh, we have to walk out of here ready to step up and do a little bit more. Um, particular, like I said, this is Pride Weekend. Minnesotans United is looking to touch every one of those 350,000 people who are going to be at the festival and parade, some other activities related to Pride for those of the two biggies. Um, and they need to fill 2,000 volunteer shifts. Um, and I still think they're trying to fill those. So go to mnunited.org and there's a place to sign up and they'll have you show up somewhere like a half hour early um, for your shift to get a quick little training and it'll be super fun. This is a very friendly crowd, but to your point, amazingly, so many folks, even in the LGBT and allied community, are totally unaware that this is happening. Or if they are, it's only very dim and they don't know how to get connected to it or what to think about it. So big, big opportunity, plus it's super fun. So sign up for a pride volunteer shift this weekend. And look for opportunities to be engaged in our campaign and other work that's going to be about stopping these two amendments and turning out, having the conversations to turn out the vote to stop these amendments and have a positive November 6th. And you are the critical folks in making that happen. We can provide some leadership. We need you to step up to leadership as well. Eric? Uh, yeah, I just want to inform everybody I'm going to try to get the video done. Um, by maybe Monday night. I'll post it on our website at uh, sd63dfl.org. I'll send out an announcement on our email list. That's the clipboard that was going around. So maybe you get to see yourselves on video. We'll see how it turns out. Awesome. So thank you to the good people of the North Bay. This is a great community resource that they opened up for us today. Thank all of you for coming, being part of the conversation, being part of the work going forward. Thank you.